I hope you're having a great day so far. Um, we wanted to apologize for making you guys wait so long for that last video, but I think it was worth it. Not only that, but a lot of you guys reached out to us to make sure everything was okay, and that just really touched us, so we're gonna try and do some smaller, more consistent videos. Also, if you haven't seen the Homunculus Unveiled video and you like long-form content, make sure you check that out. In that video, we break down the idea and the history of the Homunculus. It'll help understand these pop culture videos that we're going to be working on. I think it's safe to say that even if it wasn't directly noticeable, that this subject has been in our faces since we were children. So today we're going to be discussing one of my favorite shows as a kid, The Powerpuff Girls. Powerpuff Girls was one of the most popular shows in the late 90s. The art style was completely unique, the animation was surreal and unforgettable. You know, very appealing to young children with the simple shapes and colors and funny narrator. However, the subject matter of the show was actually quite dark and oftentimes disturbing. But we all know that as kids, we don't really pick up on that stuff. All we can see is these adorable, butt-kicking supergirls. Now, as adults, we can see how strange, horrifying, and bizarre some of these episodes truly were. So who are the Powerpuff Girls? The story revolves around three kindergarten-aged girls who have superpowers, Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup. They each have their own personality and color, Blossom being the leader, showing both feminine and masculine attributes, Buttercup being the masculine energy of the group, and Bubbles being the feminine aspect. Now this was aired on Cartoon Network, so it definitely was designed for children. Yet the subject matter of the show references some of the deepest secrets of alchemy in the occult. So what is the show really about? Well, it starts with a scientist named Professor Utonium. He's, you know, a scientist trying to discover the mysteries of the universe. He ends up attempting to engineer the perfect little girls in his lab, when a mystery ingredient called Chemical X is accidentally added to his mix. The intro scene makes it seem that it was the professor's fault, but just out of frame, there is his monkey lab assistant, who's throwing a temper tantrum, forcing the professor's elbow to crash into the round bottom flask, releasing this mysterious liquid into the magical girl concoction. Remember Libravaki? Well, basically, this monkey is the key to the genesis of the Powerpuff Girls in more ways than one. So what the heck is Chemical X? Well. It's a black goo-like substance that we see inside of this large flask, possibly representing the Philosopher's Stone or the final ingredient to the creation of the homunculus. As a result of mixing the chemical X in a cauldron with sugar or fermentation, then spice or you could say herbs, and then everything nice, which seems to be a reference for astrology or astral energies, as it seems to represent the desires for gifts from imagination, stars, rainbows, animals, then, after choosing these three ingredients to create the perfect little girls, the accident occurs and the chemical X black goo substance falls into the mixture. This event creates these three divine glowing beings that are little children with big heads, reminiscent of a makeup powder puff or even a powder puff flower. This is of course blatantly alchemical, but it goes much deeper than that. There's one particularly shocking episode that shows the very dark side of the sacred knowledge. Knock it off. In season 4, episode 7, there's an episode called Knock it off, and it begins with the professor getting a phone call from his old college roommate Dick Hardley. Now, this character is not in any other episodes, and it's very weird that they would name him Dick. Yeah, sure, that's a very common guy name and he is a jerk, but it seems this name was chosen on purpose to represent a specific symbol. Could be that it's a generative reference. Well, this dick hardly wants to meet up with the professor just to catch up. And the professor, feeling nostalgic, starts to reminisce on old times, and interestingly, there's a shot where he says, we explored and discovered the universe together. Now on its own, it doesn't seem like much, but when you add it together with everything else, this is a clear reference to the ancient astrologers, as the professor is essentially a modern day alchemist. However, Dick is shown to not really have done any of the work, merely parasiting off the professor who was completely oblivious to this fact. Dick took credit for Utonium's work all the time, and he hasn't changed one bit. 
it's pretty obvious that the only reason he's even visiting the professor is to see if he can pilfer any of his old buddy's fresh ideas. So Professor Dick shows up at the Utonium household, unaware of the Powerpuff Girls since he lives in a different town. While well, Professor Utonium gives him a tour of the house while Dick probes him for information on how much money he's making, all the while roasting him on the interior of his house. When he asks to see the lab, Utonium says oh, he doesn't want to go in there because it's messy and it's being cleaned by the girls. Dick suggests that the kids go play somewhere else because he and their dad have business to discuss. But before he can finish that thought, he witnesses the Powerpuff Girls flying around and cleaning the room with their superpowers. He immediately, without hesitation, sees this as an opportunity for making insane amounts of money. The professor, however, views them as children, his daughters, and he proudly states that he's their creator and their father. But of course, Dick can only see them as a gold mine. Dick even reveals why he actually came. He says that he knew one of Utonium's little inventions would turn into a cash cow. He even suggests marketing the Powerpuff Girls as a food. Seriously, what a sick and twisted guy. This outburst naturally infuriates the professor and he sternly tells Dick to leave immediately and to keep clear of him and his kids forever. However, Dick keeps pressing him from outside his house before he has another big brain idea. He ends up stalking the girls and like a creep, he pulls up to them while they're just leaving school. They know they're not supposed to talk to strangers, but then he reminds them that he was roomies with their dad, so they think it's okay. Blossom comments on his cool car and he jumps on the opportunity and weirdly asks them if they want to ride home. On the way to their house, he asks them what they're made of and they tell him and he ends up manipulating them into stealing Chemical X from Professor Utonium. Dick does this by explaining to the girls that there's just so much evil in the world, and he says how awesome it would be if there were more Powerpuff Girls that would help fight outside of Townsville. Basically, he convinces them to lie and steal for the greater good. The girls, now feeling guilty, decide to steal some Chemical X and give it to him, keeping it a secret from Professor Utonium. Dick is so desperate to get his hands on this thing. He literally says, gimme, 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 before getting it. <laughs> now, this is when it gets scary. He rushes off and heads to this really eerie abandoned factory on a cliff over the water, which he breaks into in order to start mass producing his own Powerpuff Girls. So he takes the ingredients and the chemical X and uses them to create his own Powerpuff Girls like a mad scientist we see a very similar scene to the opening intro, but of course different. The look on his face is greed the entire time. Once the explosion happens, we see him laughing maniacally in the corner. He then takes this creation and treats it like a product, even slapping them on the head when they're moving under the sheet. Dick, seeking investors, begins to pitch these new homunculi as the ultimate superheroes that will protect cities from evil and crime. But even with his first batch, you can tell that something's not quite right with these girls. In the next scene, we see the girls and the professor sitting on the couch watching the news, where Dick's bootleg Powerpuff Girls are seen in New York. That night in bed, the girls admit that they feel weird about lying to their dad, but try to reassure themselves that they made the right choice. The guilt-ridden words of Professor Dick clearly made an impact on them, but it's also clear that they're feeling unsure about the whole thing. After this first sale, we start to see an insane sequence. Dick is doing this in multiple cities with multiple different batches, with each batch of the unsanctioned Powerpuff Girls becoming more uncanny and deformed, and after every batch, the factory on the cliff grows more and more in size, showing this to be a very profitable operation. Dick is sending these black market Powerpuff Girls all over the world. Then we see that he invented a different way to create them for speed, and we see them on a conveyor belt looking more like hollow dolls than real-life girls. Due to his lack of care and cheap labor, they start to become all mixed up, resembling a blend of the different variations of the three girls. They're being packaged in a massive operation, handled roughly by metal claws, and placed into cardboard and plastic boxes. It's a truly heartbreaking scene when you think of how sweet and pure the original Powerpuff Girls are. But of course, all Dick cares about is money, more speed, more homunculi, this was his cash cow. All the while, these Powerpuff derivatives are flying around the world fighting crime, but the results are obviously diminished. In India, we have a Mojo Jojo counterpart, Raja Jaja, 
who's attacking the city with some crystal laser beam. Of course, India's newly purchased defense system gets the job done, but just barely. We can see the leg of one of the girls fall off like a loose tooth, showing the obvious drop in overall quality. When sales dip, Dick demands his exhausted factory workers to cut the chemical X in half. We see customers complaining to Dick on the phone where he dismisses their claims and just pushes them to buy a newer model. Then we see Dick doing quality control as he stands them all in a line and harshly judges them. In this crowd, we can see many of the Powerpuff Girls extreme are very deformed and only slightly resembling their originals. We even see a one-eyed Powerpuff Girl and even a Blemmy Powerpuff. When he sees a Buttercup clone that's perfect, he demands his workers to cut back on the sugar. He even demands that she be melted down for her chemical X. Dick even goes so far as to market these Powerpuff Girls Extreme on a cheesy TV infomercial. It's here that the girls see the commercial and become enraged by his lies. On their way to go beat his butt, the professor questions them on their world travels and they lie to him before zooming off to Dick's freaky factory. When they get there, they tell him to stop, but he completely ignores their concerns and just demands that they steal more chemical X for him. Or that's what they think. His actual plan was just to melt them down and take it from them. The girls try to retrieve the chemical X that he's got left, but in an attempt to keep it all to himself, he swallows the entire thing. When he does this, he starts convulsing, foaming at the mouth, twitching, before transforming into a massive mutant creature. It's kind of creepy because at first it's played off as a joke and then it goes into this gruesome transformation where he's some sort of hulking Cthulhu creature. From the distance, the deformed Powerpuff Girls are watching the original girls fight the mutated Dick Hardly. The girls try to fight him, but he traps them in a glass contraption designed to completely suck out the chemical X. Inside this glass tube, the girls are being extracted of their life force and an empty flask is being filled with the chemical X being extracted from them. Now, as much as I enjoy this show, I have to say that this was way too far for a concept for children to be seeing. The very next scene is the professor walking in looking for his girls, and from the back he sees three girls. He reaches out to them expectantly, but when they turn around, they're these hybrid deformed creatures and of course the professor is just horrified. He sees all the sick things that Dick has made unexplainable things. Obviously, they're trying to make this as traumatic as possible. Most disturbing of all is now his real girls are dying in the flask, being dissolved of their chemical X. Professor Utonium confronts Dick and begs him to let them go, and interestingly tries to sacrifice himself in order to save them. Word for word, Dick says, Am I to understand that you will sacrifice your life for theirs? And you'll stay here and make chemical X forever? Professor agrees as long as his girls will be safe. Unsurprisingly, greedy monster Dick Harley tells the professor that he's a fool and that he's going to keep them both. Dick tells his army of homunculi to capture the professor. And when Utonium sees this, he says, Oh Dick, what have you made? He presses himself upon the glass of the flask and reassures his girls who are lying limp on the ground that it's going to be okay. The army of monstrous beings crowd surfs Professor Utonium away, but not before he tells the girls that he loves them. Tears start to flow from his eyes, and they say that they love him back before passing out. The malformed Powerpuff Girls see this, and show for the very first time a sense of emotional depth. They've of course never heard these words before, and being made of loosely the same ingredients as the original Powerpuff Girls, they react in a similar fashion, with empathy. This empathy, though, quickly turns to fury as they realize that their creator has robbed them of the love and care they deserve. Dick demands that they take the professor away, but they rebel. They start to turn on him, chanting his name over and over again. They say, you never gave us love. They ask, where was our love? And as this is happening, the Powerpuff Girls are lying in the glass dome, looking lifeless with some sort of disease that sort of resembles leprosy. Once the bulk of the knockoff Powerpuff Girls have taken Dick Hardly down, another group lifts the dome from the girls and they tell the professor to take the girls and get out before it's too late. 
They escape by the skin of their teeth, and the professor holds his girls as he weeps. Interestingly, these tears seem to restore the Powerpuff Girls. So the professor essentially acts like a Jesus figure in healing them instantly through love, which doesn't make too much sense since all of their chemical X was extracted. Yet apparently they can be revived with love from the professor alone. Now anyone could argue that underneath the disturbing shell there's a good message about love and caring and I'm sure that's fine for an older audience, but I don't know, it just seems a little too far for a show with the TVY7 rating. I'm sure there were other ways they could have portrayed this message, but they chose to go a very dark and visually disturbing route. These symbols, I feel, were chosen on purpose to display deep occult secrets branded for young minds. Now, this isn't a complete breakdown of the Powerpuff Girls series, but there are some things we should mention before we go on. First, let's talk about the devil character. I know that this used to terrify Soul as a kid, but this demon called Him is an androgynous devil with large lobster-like claws. There's not too much known about the origins of Him, but what we do know is that this character is essentially a supernatural divine being not of this world. Him is immortal and has the ability to shapeshift, possess creatures and objects, he can control minds, stop time, and he can also cause horrific visions. He doesn't seem to have any motive other than just this pure sadistic pleasure of others' suffering. Then there's of course Mojo Jojo, the monkey who initially caused the Chemical X to fall into the cauldron. During the Chemical X explosion, a young Mojo was affected by the chemicals, turning him into a genius mutant with an enlarged brain. This also caused his skin to turn green and gave him new advanced emotions, like envy for instance. Mojo Jojo is closely related to the Powerpuff Girls, as he too was created or transformed during this accidental event. You could argue that they also have the same father. Mojo Jojo claims that he turned evil because the professor lost interest in him after the creation of the Powerpuff Girls. Now, if you remember from Book of the Cow, a monkey was used in the creation of an artificial being. Make sure you check out that 10 hour video if you want to know more about that. But it somehow gets even crazier because Mojo is not only the one who caused the accident, but he's responsible for the professor's desire to even create the perfect little girls in the first place. In an episode called Get Back Jojo, Mojo Jojo goes back in time to prevent the Powerpuff Girls from ever existing. This episode begins at career day at Pokey Oaks Kindergarten, the school the Powerpuff Girls attend. When it's the professor's turn, he shows off a new invention, a time machine. Interestingly, some of these levers do look very alchemical, and this machine allows one to go back to any time that he wishes. While he's presenting this, Mojo Jojo walks by the school and overhears him talking about how the professor didn't even want to be a scientist, and that it was some mysterious event in the past that inspired him to become a scientist and create the Powerpuff Girls, but he doesn't mention what this is. Mojo Jojo sees this as an opportunity. He makes the decision to kidnap a girl named Mary and steal her clothes to hide in the crowd as an imposter. Seems kind of messed up. For some reason, the professor is smart enough to create a time machine, but not smart enough to notice a green monkey wearing a dress. So there's this strange obliviousness with the professor that often contradicts his level of intelligence. This is actually further expanded upon when Mojo Jojo realizes that the professor can dial in the exact time when he was inspired. Upon doing this, Mojo Jojo discards Mary's stolen dress and jumps into the time machine in an effort to stop the professor from ever getting inspired. So Mojo Jojo goes through a time loop and goes back to the same school in 1959. He begins looking for the professor in the school and hears a classroom in session. He looks through the window and sees a very smart kid who was basically the know-it-all of the class and he sort of looks like Professor Utonium and so Mojo Jojo starts to think that this is the professor. But it's not. The professor is actually the kid behind this know-it-all, and then we see this kid with a square-shaped head who was the bully class clown, and lo and behold, it's the young Professor Utonium. Basically, when Mojo first looks into the window, the classroom is watching this movie on volcanoes. This is no accident, and there is symbolism at play. We see this old safety film on Townsville, where the the first shot has a huge sign that says, eat pork, and that doesn't seem like an accident. 
we learn that there's an active volcano. This is no ordinary volcano, and I would argue it's a symbol for Vulcan and or sacrifice. The movie is a safety video on volcanoes, but it's obviously being cryptic. It says, quote, Jimmy thought it would be cool to goof around the volcano. And the thing is, is that the authors of this specifically hid what they were trying to say by making it essentially PG, instead of Jimmy falling in the volcano, which is obviously what they were suggesting. For some reason, instead of showing Jimmy falling in the volcano, he actually gets in an accident while driving and dies. The kids are also shocked upon seeing this. Then we see three girls who love to hang out on top of the volcano. This again is no accident. But we find out that this volcano actually causes disease and people become very sick. The narrator urges children to talk to their parents about the volcano. Upon one child asking the parent about whether he can play on the volcano or not, and then the father pulls down the newspaper and we see that he's covered in hives and tumors. He says, I'm glad you asked that question, but he never really actually answers him strangely. Then we see the mayor of Townsville come into the video and he has a special message. He says, hey kids, my favorite thing to do is to throw things in the volcano. Try it, it's great fun. Whoa, wait, I thought this was a safety film for children. And they obviously let the mayor on to give a special message. Sure, the narrator tries to correct him. And you may think that they're just discussing throwing random objects in the volcano. But they are referencing children. That's the scary part. He literally says, no, I mean throw things into the volcano. The narrator doesn't even argue with him or try to correct him. And then the film abruptly ends with the scientist, mayor, and a person inside of a volcano suit that looks very similar to a Yule log. We also see three children watching these three figures. After the lights are turned on, there is this weird scene with Cerebellum, and this is another weird reference in the show. It's very interesting that we get a puzzle piece in that her face is covered with an apple representing the fruit of knowledge. To quickly note, Cerebellum is the mayor's loyal secretary and deputy. Now in this episode, we see that the mayor is already very old in 1959, and Miss Bellum is just a child. Yet in another episode, Speed Demon, we learn that Miss Bellum has an obsessive attachment to the mayor's hat and actually insinuates that she was always in love with him, despite the fact that he's married and decades older than her. Let's not forget all these strange sexual innuendos present with her scenes and how obviously the mayor is attracted to her. He even gets her to dress provocatively for his pleasure in the episode Impeach Fuzz. She's considered to be the brains behind the mayor who believes that she's the head of Townville as she handles most of the mayor's priorities. So she's essentially a secret Red Queen. This very well can connect to Mary Magdalene or a harlot fertility god as Bellum is also representative of the Sarah Bellum. It's interesting because she's considered the fourth Powerpuff Girl for some reason. She even helps him out on multiple occasions. She's also considered a recluse, but that's never fully explained, especially with her looks. Also. Miss Bellum was removed from the 2016 reboot because they thought that she was offensive. Anyways, so this is when Mojo Jojo discovers that the professor is not the know-it-all of the class, but actually the jerk bully with the square head. This is shocking because there's no way that this kid just got inspired and became Professor Utonium. Well first off, he's playing fart pranks constantly and gets the smart kid in trouble. So he's essentially just like Dick Hardly and has no emotions whatsoever. He has fun being cruel, but it gets worse. So apparently, they're actually doing an experiment in class that involves creating a miniature volcano. The instructions were to take the milk bottle, and then take clay and work it into your hands, and they were to mold this clay around the bottle in order to create a replica volcano. But something strange is going on with the young Professor Utonium. He starts to basically get possessed by some type of demon. He creates a monster unlike the other kids which is 100% a reference to the Golem, but not just that, most likely Moloch or Vulcan and the idea of a sacrifice to some sort of god. After sculpting the monster, the teacher instructs to pour the water into the bottle, which is the mouth of this little creature. He pours the water into the mouth of the monster with a strange dark voice that we never hear from the professor. This is a completely different personality and it becomes clear that he's becoming possessed or something. The teacher then says, add two drops of red coloring. 
So no, this is not looking too far deep into it. The proof is in the next shot. Utonium hears the instructions, but then says, Blood, blood for monster, while blood drips down the mouth of the creature. Um, what? Are we supposed to just ignore that? Why is this in a kid's show? Well, we aren't done and it gets worse. Even Miss Keen, now as a child, we see her looking at Utonium in complete fear as he pours his blood down the monster's mouth. So obviously she thought he was possessed too. He says, Monster loves to drink blood. It's one thing to play around for a second as a child and being edgy. But first off, they're like in kindergarten, so where did this come from? Well, Utonium starts putting all sorts of chemicals in the mouth, alluding to another creation event, similar to with the Powerpuff Girls. He starts pouring many different chemicals in this mixture, which ends up creating a bomb. This almost kills the children as the entire class is set on fire. And as this happens, Mojo Jojo sees this as an opportunity and kidnaps the child Professor Utonium. Right after this, the Powerpuff Girls show up and are looking for the professor. And even a kid is horrified and says, it's the apocalypse. Okay, so what does Mojo Jojo plan to do with Professor Utonium? Well, they don't ever directly say, but he heads to the volcano. Are we seeing the connection? He realizes that his observatory is no longer there. He's making his way up the volcano as Utonium is completely passed out. It's not clear yet, but he's intending to sacrifice Utonium to this volcano god. There's no other explanation for the blood scene right before this. That's the only rational conclusion. Utonium wakes up and bites Mojo Jojo's finger and luckily manages to fall back down to the bottom of the volcano. This is when we discover that Utonium has no interest in science whatsoever and that he had never even thought of the Powerpuff Girls. He even thought of the idea of being called a professor was kooky. Science? Forget it, that's Dolesville. Mojo Jojo's even like, um, okay, this is weird, this makes no sense. But then decides that regardless, he still needs to get rid of them so that he doesn't even have a chance to create the Powerpuff Girls. You can even see that Utonium is visibly afraid as Mojo Jojo is doing this to a young child attempting to get rid of him, but interestingly, because of this bully personality, he ends up punching Mojo Jojo and says, I don't like your attitude. Maybe I should just go create some of those powder puff girls you keep yapping about. It was Mojo Jojo going back in time, asking him about the power puff girls that was the secret event that inspired Utonium to create the power puff girls. It was Mojo Jojo all along. By asking over and over again, Utonium decides he's tired of listening to this green monkey and is just going to go be a professor. Which makes no sense, that's not inspiration at all. He was just annoyed. There's no evidence that he had the skills or personality traits to develop into Professor Utonium as an adult. Upon hearing this, Mojo Jojo freaks out and still doesn't understand that he is the one who inspired him. So he forcibly grabs Utonium and yells out to him to tell him the secret of what inspired him. He says, if you won't tell me, I will have to use other methods of persuasion. Okay, so torture or death? Is he treating a child like this on a children's show? What do we see next? Mojo Jojo is climbing the volcano while he drags Utonium by the hair up the mountain. This is blatant torture. And he's literally crying and saying, let me go. Mojo Jojo tells him to shut up as he prepares to throw him in the volcano. We finally get the answer. This volcano is indeed connected with sacrifice, as Mojo Jojo throws Utonium into the volcano for death. This connects the older safety film and the monster with blood to this scene. There's no other explanation for those earlier shots other than this is blatant occult symbolism being foisted on the minds of children. Now of course with these cutesy shows, they always have to do this subtly or add elements to the end where you think the superhero saved the day. But it's not about that. It's about the subjects and symbols that are projected from the story as a whole. This is a way that they can hide deep occult knowledge right in the open, and this has been done with countless kids shows and movies. So what we have is a professor who as a child was demonically possessed and had no intention to be a scientist. He is a part of a contradictory time loop where in the future, after the creation of the Powerpuff Girls, Mojo Jojo, and his time machine, 
This leads to Mojo Jojo going back in time and being the originator of the inspiration to create the Powerpuff Girls. So why doesn't Mojo just make his own Powerpuff Girls? Well, in the season 1 episode 12, The Rowdy Rough Boys, Mojo Jojo tires of getting his butt kicked by the girls time and time again, always ending up in jail. And after so many times, he just goes completely mad, gets fed up, and decides he needs to fight fire with fire. He decides to use his jail phone call to call the Utonium residence. Bubbles picks up on the other end, and you know, she's the most naive of the three, and he asks to speak to Professor Utonium, who is equally as naive. Mojo pretends to be a student from Townsville Community College, claiming that he's doing a project on the Powerpuff Girls. Professor Utonium gladly gives out the information. He says that it takes eight cups of sugar, a pinch of spice, and one tablespoon of everything nice, and of course accidentally dropping Chemical X into the mix. Mojo realizes that this is too girlish, so he asks himself, what are little boys made of? Undoubtedly, the same nursery rhyme comes to mind, and he collects the necessary ingredients, which are snips, which is armpit hair he gets from a fellow inmate, a snail that he gets from the cafeteria on escargot day, and then he snips off the tail of a dog. Now, the Chemical X is definitely the hardest to get ingredient. Obviously, he doesn't have pure Chemical X, but he does have a prison toilet. Now, I think the initial perception of this is that it's so nasty that it's radioactive, hence the glowing green essence. But it's no secret that some prisoners have gone so far as to use their toilets to create a fermented drink called Pruno, or prison hooch. In this instance, with Mojo, it could be that this is a fermented substance that he uses to substitute the Chemical X. Which of course begs the question again, what the heck is it? Well, whatever it is, it works. Mojo even inhales the fumes coming from the toilet and says that it's definitely Chemical X. However, this apparently isn't all it requires because the next scene he's commenting on how the crescent moon is in the proper alignment, implying that there's some sort of cosmic astrological factor to this process. He even refers to the toilet as a cauldron which he's placed candles all around, and even a human skull sits on the floor with a candle sitting on top. He says, let the seeds of evil bear fruit before flushing the ingredients down the toilet. As per usual, there's an explosion and three little boys emerge from the pot. I think it's worth noting that they do not glow like the Powerpuff Girls do. So of course, Mojo uses them to fight the Powerpuff Girls who are unable to beat them since they're pretty evenly matched. And the boys even have the same B names, Butch, Brick, and Boomer. They end up only defeating the boys by being nice and smooching the boys. For whatever reason, this disrupts their chemical composition and they explode. Now, later on, they are brought back to life by him, but let's not worry about that right now. So, if you didn't think that was weird, then get this. The Powerpuff Girls, being homunculi themselves, even create their own homunculus. Season 2, Episode 11, Twisted Sister shows the Powerpuff Girls becoming overwhelmed by their busy lives. Being heroes, doing chores and homework, superheroes or not, they're still kids. They get this idea in their head, why not create another Powerpuff Girl? So they secretly go to the professor's lab and open a book called How I Did It, and they get to work. Unfortunately, they don't have all the proper ingredients. Like, they don't have sugar, so they use artificial sweetener. And unsure where to get spices, Buttercup brings dirt and twigs and stuff. And the everything nice is just an amalgamation of things they like, so overall a whole lot of stuff. Also something I found interesting is that the Chemical X in this episode isn't black like almost every other episode, but a glowing green like in the Rowdy Rough Boys. Regardless, the same explosion scene happens and we see their creation. And even they aren't sure what to say. This purple Powerpuff is clearly not like them, more closely resembling the Powerpuff Girls that Dick Harley created back in Knock It Off. She's a giant strong Powerpuff with a spattering of teeth and at least one fully formed ear and toe, unlike the Powerpuff Girls who don't have ears or toes or anything like that. Um, it's clear that this new Powerpuff Girl that they've created is cognitively delayed. She's unable to focus on what they say, and she only loosely understands the concept of fighting crime. She ends up beating up the cops by mistake and letting all of the criminals go. The Powerpuff Girls are enjoying their free time while their new Powerpuff Girl, who they named Bunny, is wreaking havoc on Townsville, freeing all the prisoners. The girls get upset at her and reprimand her, but sadly Bunny just doesn't understand, and she flees while the girls get their butts kicked by vengeful prisoners. 
Eventually, Bunny hears their cries and returns to save them. And if you think the story can't get any more messed up, her unstable composition can't take all the crime fighting and unfortunately, she explodes. Now, obviously this show, regardless if the symbols were understood or not, had an impact on young and impressionable minds. Now we can really understand why. And I think it's because the integration of alchemical and secret knowledge. Every child is fascinated by this regardless if they understand it or not, and perhaps the writers of the show are even aware of this. Now if you thought that was just reaching or an interpretation, well the answer lies in investigating one of the directors and animators for the Powerpuff Girls, Gandhi Tartakovsky, one of the greatest animators of our time. He's a Russian-American animator known for some very influential shows and movies. He is the creator behind Dexter's Laboratory, who is a kid mad scientist who also happens to create clones of his sister and her two friends. Interestingly, the Powerpuff Girls were originally the Whoop-Ass Girls, as the creator Craig McCracken has the extra ingredient as a can of Whoop-Ass. But because this was a show for children, they had to change it. Now McCracken's idea was the Whoop-Ass can was the secret ingredient, but it's arguable that Gany Tartakovsky was the one who proposed the Chemical X idea, as we will see this symbol in all his other shows, the same black goo substance. Actually, Craig and Gendy were roommates after college, so no doubt that they built a show together. They were even roommates with the creator of My Life as a Teenage Robot, another homunculus automaton. It would seem that Craig is the humorous side of the show and Gendy is the more serious and occult animator. Well, Gendy is very fascinating because it seems to be blatantly clear that he's well aware of the secret. Although Gendy is not the creator of the Powerpuff Girls, he was responsible for writing many episodes and he storyboarded the episodes as well. We believe that he's responsible for these alchemical symbols in the Powerpuff Girls as we see the exact same symbols and scenes in his other works. Another legendary show in the early 2000s was Samurai Jack, created by Genny Tartakovsky. Originally made for children, season 1 through 4 was for Cartoon Network, and then on season 5, they decided to make Samurai Jack far more adult. Samurai Jack doesn't have the same level of disturbingness because this isn't necessarily cutesy tiny girl homunculi trying to hide deep secrets under the guise of a kid's show. Instead, Samurai Jack takes a little bit of a different approach. And specifically, the symbols that we're looking for are in Season 5, when it was established that this would now be for adults on Adult Swim. It's a little less strange because the kids who watched the show grew up with it, but it's still a little weird. The show revolves around a young prince of feudal Japan, whose father was given a magical sword by three gods. He uses this to defeat and imprison the supernatural demon Aku, which is also the same voice actor as Iroh from Avatar. The prince was sent away by his mother so that he could travel, train, and prepare for this battle with Aku. For most of the earlier seasons, Jack is assisting and saving other communities who are being abused by negative forces. He's known as a hero as he begins to help others in need. He eventually returns to fight Aku. He almost defeats Aku with his sword, which Aku is terrified of because it is the only way he can be defeated. Jack tries to land a final blow, but before he could finish, Aku placed a time curse on him, sending him into the distant future. This futuristic dystopia is the theme of season 5. And let me tell you, it's truly an amazing show. There's nothing that can take away from that. The animation is impeccable. However, there is one detail in season 5 that shows the secret blatantly. The show, Samurai Jack, is filled with homunculi. On the first episode, before the intro with the blue beings who communicate through telepathy, after Jack saves them and the intro plays, we get a very strange scene. Now it's not 100% clear what's happening right now, as all we see are seven children being birthed into an occult order. But the answer lies in another scene at the end of the season on episode 9. We'll start with that and come back to the first episode because the secret is hidden through the separation of these episodes. In season 5, episode 9, Samurai Jack and Ashi finally meet up with Aku and Aku realizes that there's more Aku near him. He looks at Ashi and takes a sniff, and then realizes it is her who has a piece of Aku in her. Wondering how this could be, he starts to remember when he personally paid a visit to the cult of Aku. He was so impressed with their worship 
that he gave the cult his essence, which is clearly black goo collected into a chalice. To explain more, this black goo is a central theme to Aku. Aku is a shape-shifting demon god of darkness, but specifically, he is some type of stag tree god. His head is the menorah, and the stag symbolism is all throughout the series. He is made of a black goo that is transformative in nature. He uses this black goo to create a variety of hybrid mutant creatures in automatons. This is artificial intelligence, and even the suits that the cult of Aku wear are made from his ashes. He is immortal, and he too was created from some type of magical green chalice in a pool of black goo. There are also many scenes where he can transform into a variety of different forms, but he also can divide himself into multiple versions of himself. Basically, as he's remembering Ashi, we get a scene that makes it clear that the lady who was pregnant in the first episode was inseminated by a woman drinking a chalice with the black goo from Aku. This in turn gives birth to seven homunculi who were birthed into an occult order as assassins. They were raised and programmed to be pure killers, believing that Aku is the highest, most benevolent god. So these seven daughters, also representative of the seven stages of alchemy, are the literal daughters of Aku, which were created through some type of alchemical ritual, praying to a demon god in the drinking of a transformative substance. Also, all the robots in this film are made of the same black goo. So even Scaramouche is a homunculus, but he's also the Pied Piper, interestingly. But that's not all. Well, Jack seems to be used as some Jesus symbol. He goes through transfiguration on a mountain where he astral projects in order to find his sword and defeat Aku. But there's also this other scene where they're taking mass amounts of children from another race of beings and implanting them with chips so that when a certain frequency is emitted, they turn into mutant creatures. Now all of that may seem like, okay, well, it's just a show. Well, the interesting thing is there are theories that say that the Powerpuff Girls and Samurai Jack are the exact same universe. Well, first off, Professor Utonium and Jack look very similar. Furthermore, in Samurai Jack, we're in the future and we can see the remnants of Townsville. Some argue that it comes from an episode from Japan, but regardless, this is the same universe. Furthermore, we now know what Chemical X is, and now we can understand why Professor Utonium was so demonic as a kid. Chemical X is Aku. Could the Powerpuff Girls be the children of Aku? They share a lot of the same powers. Superhuman strength, durability, laser eyes, fire generation, space survivability, and sonic booms to name a few. However, the crossover connections do not end here. In 2019, Gendy created a new show specifically directed towards adults. It's an animated action horror titled Primal. Now we aren't going to break down everything. The first season is pretty heavy, but the real juice is in season 2. This confirms without a shadow of a doubt that Gendy knows a secret. If you don't know what we're discussing, please make sure you watch the 10 hour Homunculus Unveiled video to see the connections. There is an episode where we see a graphic creation of a baby Homunculus. Not just that, it shows how the witches were capable of moving souls into newly formed artificial beings. The show Primal revolves around a Neanderthal named Spear and a female Tyrannosaurus Rex. And what seems to be a show about cavemen and dinosaurs is anything but that. He uses this again to encode deep knowledge and symbolism. In episode 8, called The Coven of the Damned, we see Spear and Fang are traveling as they see a massive bright green beam reaching to the sky. As they get near, they see a group of women with the same stag symbolism that we're used to seeing from Gendi and a circle around some great green fire. We then get a close up to see what really is happening. We see another caveman being burned in this fire while chained to two massive runes. He's being sacrificed in some type of ritual. This group of women are some type of ancient pagan primitive witches. Spear and Fang watch as the witches throw something into the fire, something that looks like sigils or some type of primitive writing. The caveman screams in horror as he is burned alive during this ritual. 
the witches start with a mantra and are harmonizing with each other making this blatantly clear that this is a ritual about to begin. They do this until we hear a screech. And as a little tangent, this reminds me of a Netflix movie called The Ritual, which is actually pretty good for Netflix, where it's about a cult that is deep in the woods who sacrifice individuals of the cult or newcomers to some massive deer god. So whoa, what is Genny trying to tell us? Well back to the ritual in Primal. So the next scene is a woman with a trident staff riding a pterodactyl, which seems to be a reference to riding the goat as we see in many of the old witch engravings of the 16th century. As this leader witch with the staff lands on the mountain, sort of like Moses or a prophet, the witches in the circle start chanting to her in worship, so obviously this is some type of deity. She makes her way into the ritual circle, and she looks vastly different to the other witches, almost as some sort of alien. She now makes it to the victim, and is staring in his eyes. She then raises her staff, and we begin to see serpents, again connecting back to Moses. It's more than that though. This is the same exact Gnostic Ophite symbolism that we saw on the artifacts of the Templars, some orgy involving the insemination of snakes. As she begins to summon this snake-like creature, she turns into a being made of black goo, or Aku. She transforms into a new being as these serpents emerge and she's much larger in size. This demonic stag-like being looking just like Aku, but with serpents inside and the heads of the snakes make up the eyes of the being, start to approach the victim being sacrificed. Side note, this looks just like Upgrade from Ben 10, and notice how the original witch was updated into this new demonic form. Upgrade is also the symbol for artificial intelligence and shapeshifting. Also, this demon makes a strange sound but we notice that it's the exact same sound that Ashi makes when she transforms into the same type of black goo being. Now, the true ritual begins. The stag-like goo demon is right in front of the hanged caveman. We see a serpent emerging from the creature's eye, and it makes its way into the mouth of the caveman as he screams in horror. The stag god leans back and lets the process take place. The snake is entering the body of the victim, and there was also something we didn't mention. It's that the witches wrote all these sigils in glowing paint on the caveman, and we see that these take a life of their own as they start to consolidate in his stomach. He's become impregnated. Once the sphere or egg is created in his stomach, he screams in agony as this being is starting to form. The snake then makes his way out of the mouth. The witches are chanting, and as the snake leaves his mouth, we are seeing his life force being extracted. They are harnessing the soul of this victim as he quickly ages into a skeleton and is beheaded. This snake just stole the soul of the caveman, and we see that the snake is now heading up back to the demonic stag being. Now, the snake enters the mouth of the demon, and she becomes pregnant with this new harnessed soul. But this time, the demon is not suffering. We are seeing plain and clearly the creation of a homunculus, but not just that, the reincarnation process of actually attaching a soul to a newly created body. This was known to the witches, and it seems that Gendi is well aware of this. So there is no doubt that Gendi knows about the homunculus, and that he integrated that symbolism throughout multiple shows, including kids shows. There's even a scene in Primal that is an exact copy of the scene from Powerpuff Girls when Dick Harley goes through a transformation after drinking Chemical X. Well, in Primal, there's a scene where an ape drinks black goo and then turns into a massive mutant. There's also an episode where Charles lectures on how our evolution will lead back to a primal state, insinuating that all these events actually happened in the future. However, in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Tartakovsky says that it actually does take place in the prehistoric world and not the future. So what do you think? Are the Powerpuff Girls homunculi? It is strange that these symbols would be put in kid shows but never fully explained, yet the animators themselves were fully aware of these alchemical symbols? Either way, we are big fans of Gendi so this is in no way trying to discredit his work or send any hate his way. We just wanted to ask the question, does he know the secret? Make sure you guys check out the Homunculus Unveiled documentary 
a 10 hour video that discusses in detail the history and art of creating an artificial being. This allows us to see many pop cultural references in which this knowledge is influenced, but it's more than that. Perhaps the authors and artists behind these shows are well aware of the secret and it's not just so that they can make the show more entertaining, but it's actually to embed occult knowledge and magic into the art piece itself. Let us know what you guys think in the comments. If you want to hang out and discuss similar topics, come join the Discord where we can share research with each other. With that, I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?